Welcome to the American Railroading Podcast, brought to you by the Revolution Rail Group, live from the great state of Texas. Join us as we educate, entertain, and explore the world of American railroading. Here's your host, industry veteran, Don Walsh. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to the American Railroading Podcast. I am your host, Don Walsh, President and CEO of the Revolution Rail Group, the anchor sponsor for the American Railroading Podcast. We are a consulting and brokering firm in the rail car industry. So if you need any kind of consulting services, whether it's merger and acquisition consulting, market analysis, process low analysis, we can help you with that. We can also help you with buying, selling, and leasing or subleasing of rail cars. You can reach out to us today at 844-455-3434 or our website, therevolutionrailgroup.com. You can also email us at info at therevolutionrailgroup.com. Well, spring has sprung here in the Houston area, and you can tell because everything's covered in a fine green dust everywhere from all the pollen. So those with allergies are are waiting for this rain that we had uh, yesterday to wash everything away. Um, but also we have the beautiful blue bonnets and things uh, popping up right now, so it kind of makes up for it. So happy spring, everybody, and especially to my family in the Chicagoland area who are getting eight inches of snow right now as we record this episode. So uh, I miss you. I don't miss the snow. So <laughs> you're welcome to come here to visit anytime. And with that, I want to say thank you to all of you again for continuing to keep us in the top 10% of all podcasts worldwide. It is truly a blessing. Uh, it's unbelievable. We've been downloaded now in 37 countries around the world uh, and 34 different podcast platforms. Of course, our number one uh, download is the United States. Second is Canada and third is Australia. So thank you to our friends in Canada and Australia. And I wanted to give a shout out to a couple more countries and I'm going to try to do this every episode for the folks listening around the world. So thank you to folks in the Netherlands, Germany, France, Costa Rica and Israel and New Zealand. While we have listeners all over the place, folks, we're going to mention each of them as we can uh, episode to episode. So thank you all for listening and for and for following us as well. So please continue to download, continue to share and continue to leave us reviews because reviews are so helpful to us. It really helps push us out further into the interwebs through the algorithms. Um, so we leave us reviews, a five star, of course, if you would, please. Uh, whether it's on Apple or Spotify or even on our website, you can go to www.americanrailroading.net and leave us a review there as well. And if you liked what you heard on our podcast, you can also leave us a tip of sorts by buying us a cup of coffee. So if you go to our website, again, at AmericanRailroading.net, you'll see a little yellow coffee cup in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. You can click on that and you can buy us one cup, three cups, five cups, or 10 cups of coffee. And it's like leaving us a tip for doing a good job. So if you like what you've heard or what you've seen on the podcast, please feel free to do so. Thank you again to those that have and those that will. Don't forget, if you like the video versus the audio, you can also watch us on our YouTube channel. Um, our YouTube channel is at YouTube at American Railroading Podcast. So I know I've said this before, but I used to hate watching myself on video. Um, so I've gotten a little more comfortable with that. And hopefully I've gotten a little better at it as well. Um, so thank you to those of us that are subscribing on YouTube because there's there's several of you now on YouTube as well. So we've got followers on audio and video. So whatever you prefer, we've got you covered. Also, our online store is live. Folks, I am so excited about that. As you know, it took months of preparation and, and planning to get this off the ground, but I really think you're gonna enjoy it. We've already had our first orders placed and the very first order was for challenge coins. So thank you for that because what's what's so important about the challenge coins is not only is it representing um, railroading in our industry, our veterans in our industry, but it's also gonna support Boots for Troops. So a portion of the sales of our challenge coins in 2024 is gonna go to support Boots for Troops here in Magnolia, Texas. So. So thank you for the purchase of our challenge coins, as well as all of our merchandise. And we've got you covered again on everything from hats and hoodies and travel mugs and mouse pads, you name it. And what you'll see too, is that there's gonna be labeling where on the um, website, when you click on different items, it'll either say AR or AR podcast. So I wanna take a second to explain that. So AR is American Railroading and AR podcast is obviously the American Railroading podcast. So you can support either or. You can support your love of American Railroading or your love of the podcast, whichever you prefer. And you can go to our website again at AmericanRailroading.net and click on the store tab and purchase to your heart's desire. We would love that. We're continuing to accept podcast sponsorships for 2024. So we have two gold sponsorships remaining. We have several silver sponsorships remaining. Um, but if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to us at marketing at AmericanRailroading.net. Again, that's marketing at AmericanRailroading.net. But please hurry because we're getting a lot of calls and emails about this. So spots are limited, uh, but feel free to reach out to us today. And we'll talk about the different spot podcast sponsorship packages we have 
have available. Now you'll notice that the one sponsorship package I did not mention was the Platinum sponsorship. And that is because, I'm very excited to announce this, we have our Platinum sponsor on board. So our Platinum sponsor is the Alden Company. So let me take just a moment to tell you a little bit about our new Platinum sponsor. Founded in 1904, Alden has been an industry leader charting a steady course in the manufacturing and distribution of a wide variety of railroad safety and track repair tools and more. The Alden website boasts over 800 catalog items to choose from, with categories including track maintenance and repair, derailers and railers, signs and lights, wheel chocks and stops, rail cars and locomotives, and even truck docks. Alden provides outstanding customer service with a wide variety of solutions, and when you call them, you will always get a real person to talk to not an automated service. While based in the Chicagoland area, the Alden name is known internationally. And with over 120 years in the rail industry, they're a company you can count on. Please reach out to our friends at Alden today at 847-623-8800 or e-rail at aldenco.com. You can also review all of their products and resources on their website at www.aldenco.com. Alden, keeping things on track since 1904. So thank you again to the Alden Company for being our platinum sponsor and specifically to CEO Mike Lannon. Uh, Mike, thank you for everything and for all of your employees, everybody involved with Alden Company. We're so excited to have you as a part of our podcast. With that, I want to say happy anniversary. Producer John, happy anniversary. It's our one year anniversary of the podcast. And it's crazy because it's actually one year to the day of our first episode recording, it which is. yeah, it's one year to the day. And so I'm really excited about that. And thank you to everyone that's listened, everyone that's downloaded, everyone that's shared, everyone that's viewed. And also I want to take a second and thank our friends at Whistle Stop Cafe in Conroe, Texas. For those of you watching, I'm going to lift up this plate with these heavy pieces of cake here. They gave us a piece of chocolate eruption which it looks like it, and a very large piece of carrot cake. I haven't decided which one I'm going to take yet, but uh, thank you to Whistle Stop Cafe in Conroe, Texas, for giving us this wonderful dessert celebrating our one-year anniversary. And I thought it would be appropriate for today as our first episode. Those of you that have listened to it, and if you haven't, shame on you, go back and listen to episode one of season one. Uh, it was hazmat that we talked about, hazmat safety by rail. And so today, I thought it would be appropriate to have hazmat as our topic again. We're going to focus a little bit more on other topics in hazmat, including transloading. But I am honored to have as our guest for the anniversary, our first guest of the podcast ever. And that is Wendy Buckley, my dear friend. And she is founder, president, and CEO of STARS Hazmat Consulting. Wendy is a graduate of the University of Finley in Ohio with a Master of Science degree in Environmental Health and Safety, otherwise known as eh &S. Wendy has spent 26 years in the industry with significant background in hazmat, which includes roles with the Federal Railroad Administration, or the FRA, as we knowingly love and call them, the New Jersey Department of Transportation, County Fire Departments as a first responder, hazmat tech, firefighter, and EMT. She's been an instructor and trainer for educators and the U.S. military. She's an adjunct professor teaching hazmat transportation. Wendy also appears monthly on a show on Sirius XM Radio. She publishes a weekly newsletter called Hazmat Chronicle. She's also written a book regarding hazmat transportation, which listeners can find on Amazon. We'll provide the link also. You can check that out. Wendy has received over 24 honors and awards, including the 10 most successful business women to watch in 2022, the 2022 Ben Salem Business Hall of Fame, 20 most inspiring women leaders of 2022. And I'm sure there's way more from last year that I'm not even aware of. So uh, <laughs> I'll get those for next time. Uh, Wendy resides in Indianapolis, Indiana with her four young children, ages seven and seven, because she has twins, five and three. Her hobbies include competitive pistol shooting and rock climbing. We are truly thrilled to have Wendy back on our podcast for our one-year anniversary episode. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome back to the American Railroading Podcast. Oh, thank you, John. I'm so glad to be back. I was honored to be your first guest, and I'm so excited that we get to do this again. I didn't realize it was the exact same day. That is that is incredible. I love it. All part of the plan, Wendy. All part of the plan. <laughs> So can you believe it's been a year already? I mean, and so much has happened in that year. And you've actually been a listener, I believe, throughout the year. Is that right? Yes, I have. All right. So what are, what are your thoughts on the podcast for the first year? You know, like you said, it, it was good to begin with. And as time went on, it got better and better. Um, it's been so exciting to see you grow and to become one of the top 10 podcasts in the world. That I mean, that's just incredible. What an honor 
congratulations on that. I'm so proud to have been a part of it. Well, thank you. And you're a big part of it. So thank you again. Uh, anything new and exciting in your world with uh, Stars Hazmat over the last year? I know you made a big move from the Sunshine State to the Hoosier State. Yeah, that's been a bit of an adjustment. Uh, I don't think I've thought out in four or five months. <laughs> I probably won't for another four or five. Yeah. So so on the personal level, that's been the biggest change and it's been a change. Um, professionally, we have uh, we've always been very heavily involved in rail and rail is truly my passion. But we've uh, recognized that there's an opportunity to better serve the trucking industry as well. So we've sort of branched out into some very high level training for truck drivers. And we've gotten a lot more involved with warehousing as well than we had been in the past because uh, of a need that we saw people discovering they have hazmat they didn't know they had. Uh, so that's been really exciting for me. It's been nice to diversify and get involved in some different things. Well, that's a lot. So congratulations on a great year and the move yeah. to Indiana. You're closer to my family now. So be sure to wave and say hello as you ro roll through the western suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> I well, I'm in Chicago quite frequently. Oh, there you go. So I was very intrigued because I didn't know this last year about your involvement with pistol marksmanship. And so I'm an enthusiast myself. I actually did some pistol marksmanship through college and different things like that. So, uh, but not competition, not like you're doing. I'm just kind of curious, uh, what's your favorite range pistol? Uh, I've got a Smith & Wesson uh, 2.0, nine millimeter. I, I absolutely love it. I have a couple of different weapons now. I never picked up a gun until October of last year and I somehow took to it pretty quickly. I got some lessons of course, cause you know, that's important. Got to be pretty decent at it. So I started in a competition uh, last May was my first one, and there was three rounds, and my very first round, I got first place. Mm -hmm. Yes, and my second round, I got second place. The third round, which was uh, something I had never done before, where you're actually moving and shooting and walking through a, a very long <laughs> obstacle course kind of thing, and I came in fourth place for that one. So third overall, I was pretty proud of myself for the very first one. So I have fell in love with it ever since, and yeah, I'm going to keep doing it. Well, that, yeah, as you should. Be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's amazing. Um, and it's something that I'm, I've always been passionate about as well. Maybe not as good as you, though, <laughs> but it's something I've always enjoyed. <laughs> I had a really great teacher, so. <laughs> oh, that, that's great. And it's it's important for all of us out there to have some sort of an outlet, some sort of a hobby. So I'm glad you found your your outlet. And it sounds like you really enjoy it. Now, yeah, it's a very expensive hobby, though, I will say. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. So assuming that we have listeners today that we didn't have on the first episode um, that maybe aren't familiar with hazmat, can you take a minute and just kind of tell our listeners and viewers what is hazmat? The first thing I want to say is everyone thinks hazmat is something you just only come across once in a while. And let me disavow you of that notion right off the bat. Everything that you come into contact with in your daily life is either made from a hazardous material or it is a hazardous material itself. Everything from the phone in your pocket to the clothing on your back to the food you're eating. Um, it's all the result of hazardous materials. So hazardous materials is defined as something that poses an unreasonable risk to health, safety, and, and property and transportation. As a result, there is a ton of regulations to mitigate those hazards and keep people safe. And as we say in the railroad industry in particular, those regulations are written in blood, meaning things happen, people got hurt or worse. And so they wrote regulations to try to prevent those things from happening. So those regulations over the course of the last, I think, 70-ish years or so, maybe a little bit more, have uh, have really um, e evolved and become kind of complex. So one of the main things that I try to help my clients do is to understand those regulations and more importantly, how they apply to them. Because Keeping their employees safe, keeping uh, their company safe from uh, exposure, liability. That, I mean, that's the whole reason that I do what I do. So keeping those um, safety measures front of mind while not crippling their business is uh, the best way to handle that. And hazardous materials are transported by rail uh, every day, and they arrive yes. safely to the majority of their customers uh, the majority of the time. In fact, it has a... a 0.001% failure rate, uh, which is yes. the lowest in the in modes of transportation of freight transportation by ground. So yes. is it true that most derailments happen harmlessly in rail yards, for instance, and where there is no product release? Yeah. So actually, there's about 1.6 billion tons of freight moved every year. And like you said, there's only about 1% of those is ever involved in a derailment. And 0.001% of those actually has a release of materials. And as you said, most of the derailments are simply a wheel came off the track and they just had to put it back on. Nothing nothing major. And they mostly do happen in yards. Um, there are obviously some mainline derailments and those typically don't result in any releases either. These, these rail cars 
particularly tank cars when it comes to hazardous materials, that's where most of the hazmat freight is, they are built very robustly. They have uh, been operating for 50 years, some of them, with no incidents. They can roll over and still not leak. They can come off their, their wheels and still not leak. Uh, they're, they're strong. They're well-built. And as long as the shipper's prepared it properly, they are designed to hold that material in the package and they do it well. And in the event that there is a derailment and a product release, remediation needs to take place. So yes. can you walk us through the most common remediation options that are available and what determines what option is best? So let me start with your second question first, and that is the option that's best has a lot to do with the factors that are happening, what the temperature is, what the uh, precipitation level is, the wind direction, and more importantly, the surrounding community. So uh, residences, hospitals, schools, other businesses, or maybe it's out in the middle of nowhere and the risk is a lot lower. Um, if there's waterways involved, particularly navigable waterways, um, those are much more sensitive than if they're out in the middle of a field. Okay, uh, so the options we have available to you depend a lot on the on the conditions on the ground at the time it happens. The options that are available uh, depend again on what the circumstances are. If you have a release, is it just a spill? Um, is the product corrosive? Is it flammable? Is it on fire? Is it a small leak? Is it a large leak? Is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Is it gas? Those things all dramatically affect what you're going to do. If it's a solid, chances are it's probably easy to clean up, sweep up, vacuum up, whatever the size of the spill dictates. Liquids obviously are a little bit more difficult to clean up, but they can soak into the soil or they can ride on top of the soil. You may have to dig it out with a backhoe or something along those lines. If it's a gas, is it going to stay along the ground? And, and sink down to the bottom and go into valleys and low areas, or is it going to be dispersed into the air uh, relatively quickly? The, you know, there's a range of things that can happen. So the options that you have are, you know, fire suppression, um, spill abatement, um, damming and diking to prevent spills from spreading, and doing whatever you can to prevent exposures. A lot of times that might involve either sheltering in place for the surrounding community or potentially evacuation if if it really needs to happen. Well, and that brings us to my next topic, which was one year ago when we did our episode together. It was shortly after the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, on February 3rd of 2023. Um, so we spoke about not necessarily the derailment itself, but the remediation <laughs> portion and the method that was chosen at that time uh, to remediate the vinyl chloride from five tank cars, which was a controlled burn. Um, for those that haven't listened to the previous episode, which again, folks, you need to go back and do that. So shame on you go back and listen to season one, episode one with Wendy and I. But for those that have it, can you take a moment to explain to everyone why that choice was made to do a controlled burn? Yeah, and I actually do have a little bit more current information since we last spoke a year ago. So um, let me discuss what I talked about before and then let me give you the new information following that. So what we knew at the time of the last episode was that uh, the material was vinyl chloride and the fear was that it was polymerizing which is basically a reaction where it becomes a uh, plastic type material that can clog up valves and fittings because these cars were on fire and they were, uh, they were hot and they were leaking and they were potentially um, polymerizing. The concern was that they were going to have a blevy, which is a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And basically what that means is there's, there's increasing pressure inside the rail cars. And as that heats up, um, it starts to exceed the burst pressure of the car and the car can no longer take that kind of internal pressure pushing on the walls. So it has a mechanical explosion. There's been lots of videos on YouTube and all over the internet of rail cars having this blevy incident and half of the tank car can go flying a mile, a mile and a half and, and cause some real damage. Um, so the fear was having this massive ex mechanical explosion from increased uh, pressures that the car couldn't take. Um, so one of the things that they tried to do was they tried to uh, release the material from the valves on the car. The car was upside down and the material kept clogging the valves and they weren't able to get it out. So what they ended up doing was hot tapping, or attempting to hot tap the car, meaning they basically insert a valve in the car somewhere where valves are not normally located in order to get that material out. They had the same problem with the hot taps that they did with the car's own valves, which was that they were clogging up. Um, since then, we have learned that one of the reasons or the main reason it appears the valves have clogged up was because the aluminum manway covers on the cars had melted. So the car is primarily steel, carbon steel, and the uh, the covers on these particular cars were aluminum. So as this fire happened, they heated up and they melted into the valves. 
Um, so whether they, it, there hasn't been any, at least not that I've seen, definitive information about whether it did actually get inside the springs and things, or it just coated the valve, we're not sure, but at least not from what I've seen so far. Since then, we've also discovered from the NTSB report that was published that um, there was apparently no immediate threat of polymerization with this material. The, the way vinyl chloride works is you have to put an inhibitor into it. And typically, depending on weather conditions, they put about 10 days worth of inhibitor in the in the material. So it can take 10 days of transportation to get where it's going before it's going to have this reaction. That that inhibitor will break down more quickly under hot conditions, so such as a fire. So there, the concern of the incident commander, the fire department on scene, was that this material was breaking down and was this material was uh, going to be starting to have this chemical reaction that produces a lot of heat and a lot of pressure. Um, apparently, there was uh, representatives from the company that had manufactured this vinyl chloride on scene, and the information that this was not going to polymerize and was not in danger of polymerizing never got to the incident commanders, never got to the emergency response uh, contractors. They didn't know that. Their information that they had been told led them to believe they had an imminent threat. So under the circumstances of what they knew, they they made the right choice. They made the, it was the best choice out of a whole bunch of bad options. Um, and uh, so, you know, burning the material off obviously could potentially expose the communities to the vinyl chloride. Not burning it off and not letting the material out could potentially cause this mechanical explosion. So they, they were faced with a lot of bad options. Had they known the information from the company, they probably would have made a different choice. Which leads me again to my next question. So a year later, with the information that you have now, is your opinion different on the decision that they made with the controlled burn? You know, I can sit here Monday morning quarterback because I have information they didn't have. Sure. If I had the information now that I have today, yes, I would have made a different choice. And I bet you every single person on scene would have done the same thing. Based on what they knew at the time, they truly made the best choice they thought they had in front of them. Um the real problem was the breakdown in communication and the company representatives, the subject matter experts for this product, not being involved in the discussion. And I'm not going to speculate as to why that why that happened, but clearly a breakdown in communication for some reason. So, so what could one have of the been... lessons that I think we should learn from this incident is how important that communication is, particularly with the experts on this material, people who know what it's going to do, when it's going to do, how they prepped it, and so forth. That really has to be priority for the incident commanders, and that's a real learning experience. Yeah, and I'm just curious. Uh, again, we're just talking hypotheticals, but if if it, they had known what we know now, uh, what would have been another option, perhaps? Well, the other option would have been just to keep the cars cool and uh, give it time to for it to burn out, and you know, make sure it didn't it didn't continue to heat up and this sort of thing. Um, there was no immediate threat of the polymerization. So the main concern would have been turned to putting out the fire from the other car that had caught fire. Understood. Thank you for that and for the update as well. You're, you're welcome. So when I worked for G Rail many, many, many years ago, which doesn't even exist anymore, it tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us uh, who entered way bills and bills of lading for cars being sent to shop, for instance, or being sent to storage, uh, we were required to take a course that was taught internally on general awareness and ha of hazardous materials, both air and ground transportation, and uh, to fulfill U.S. Department of Transportation 49 CFR 172.704 training requirements. I didn't actually remember that. I had to look at my certificate, which I still <laughs> <I> have, <laughs> um, which oddly enough, I really enjoyed the training. And so is this training, uh, and, and by the way, the FRA, I've spoken to them, and they really want car owners to have this type of training on hand for even customer service representatives. So is is this training you feel all rail car owners should have and shippers should have? Um, and if so, or if not, why? Well, it is absolutely required for shippers, no question. If you're affecting transportation of hazardous materials in the job that you're performing, whether it's paperwork, whether it's um, you're actually preparing the car for transportation, et cetera, you must be trained. One of the things that a lot of shippers leave out or companies involved in transportation at all is the procurement staff and the sales staff. I am a big proponent of getting them trained and I'll tell you why. I had a client one time that uh, they were buying, they, their procurement staff was trying to save money. They got a directive from on high, you know, you need to get X number of dollars in savings this year. So one of the procurement people decided that one of the things they were going to do was buy these gaskets that were way cheaper than the ones they had been buying. 
Unfortunately, because they had no hazmat training, they were unaware that there was a potential that the product they were shipping was incompatible with the new gaskets. So they put all these gaskets on all these cars, and this is what they they staffed all their plants with. Then these cars go out in transportation, and they're leaking all over the place because a few days or a few hours into the transportation, the gaskets are no longer uh, performing as intended. So procurement staff really, really need to be trained as sales staff too, because I have seen sales staff make promises and commitments to things that just can't happen in the way that they promised them. So and they end up looking foolish. The company ends up looking foolish and like they don't know what they're doing. When in reality, the people on the ground that are doing those jobs do know the salesperson just wasn't trained. So yes, those people definitely need to be trained 100%. As for the car owners, um, yes, if car owners are generating paperwork that uh, to send the cars to the shop, they should be trained. And I think they honestly should be should be trained anyway. Uh, I work with a lot of car owners that um, in order to manage risk, they hi- they've they hired me to help them understand what those materials were, will do to those cars. But the one really great thing about the training that either they've received before they worked with me or from me is that it gives them enough information to know they need to ask the question. One of the problems I find with non-compliance and safety violations is not that people don't want to do it. They they don't want to circumvent the rules. They're not trying to, to save money by, by cutting corners. They just don't know. And they don't know what they don't know, so they don't ask the questions. So if you get that training as a car owner or as a 3PO or as a broker, then you have the information you know to say, hey, something's not right here. Or I kind of have this sort of memory from somewhere back in my training that something might be up with this. Let me ask. If you don't have the training and you've never seen those things before, it'll just go right by you and you won't know. So it it allows car owners to be more effective. And if they are the ones generating the paperwork, then they are affecting the transportation of hazardous materials because there's residues in those cars. So at that point, once they are creating paperwork, then they do need to have that hazmat training by regulation. Yeah. And in order to even source the proper rail car for a commodity, you have to understand packing groups. And so can you take a moment to explain to our, our listeners and our audience what packing groups are and why they're so important? Yeah. Packing groups are a really big deal. So the way you classify a material, meaning determine what its hazards are, is you first have to determine which hazard class does it need, if any. Is it flammable? Is it poisonous? Is it corrosive? And the thresholds, the values for those numbers, in other words, how we determine something is flammable, it's not just because, hey, that looks like it's dangerous. It's not like, hey, that could probably catch fire. It's by flashpoint and boiling point. So they actually do scientific test data. They determine the flash point with a test where they heat the material up and, and ignite the vapors. And at what point that that happens is the flash point. Similar to what's at the initial boiling point. At what point does it heat up like steam uh, steam from water on your stove when you're boiling water? At what point does those bubbles happen and the steam happen and that sort of thing? So it's not arbitrary. It's specific information, specific data that require, that is required to determine if it's hazardous. So then you have to go one step further for certain hazard classes and you say, okay, now that I know what the hazards are, how hazardous is it relative to everything in that hazard class? So for example, let's go back to flammable liquids. In the the whole group of flammable, flammable liquids that exist in the world, how dangerous is this? Is this really, really super dangerous or is it maybe not so much, but still hazardous? So there's three levels. We call them packing groups. Packing group one is the most dangerous materials. Packing group Group three is the lowest, least dangerous, and packing group two is in the middle. Um, These are all designated with Roman numerals. And what those tell you is how strong of a package you need. So it's a little bit easier to think about in terms of boxes and drums. So if you have a packing group one material, you're going to need a really thick, robust package. So if it's a box, it's going to be five layers, paper, corrugated cardboard, paper, corrugated cardboard, paper. Um, So it's going to be a really thick, strong, heavy box. But if it's a packing group three material, it's going to be a lot thinner. It might only be three layers, paper, corrugation, paper. So um, it, it, it's all based on performance. When you get into bigger, bigger vehicles like tank cars and stuff, they're built to a standard. So if you have a particular hazard class and particular packing group, you're only going to be authorized to ship that material in certain tank cars. The more dangerous stuff has to be in the thicker, stronger tank cars. The less dangerous stuff can be in more of a general service car. And many things come with an SDS or a safety data sheet as well. Even the paint we buy at Home Depot has an SDS with it, right? And they're very important to help us understand uh, many things that are related to the product, as you talked about, flashpoint, uh, first aid, even incompatibility, whether it's with gaskets or other commodities. 
the FRA or Federal Railroad Administration requires that rail car repair facilities, as an example, have an SDS on file for the last known commodity for every tank car at their facility, and that it must be provided by the car owner, not a random general website, and that it must be current within the last 12 months. So in your opinion, why is it important that the SDS be current and that it come from the actual car owner rather than some random website? Okay. So the SDS is, like you said, it's got so much information on it. It'll tell you everything from what the car, what the material smells like, what it looks like, what to expect when you experience it, um, what PPE to come into contact with. So all of the things that that rail, that rail car shop might need to know to protect their people. So they need to, you know, limit the amount of exposure with breathing apparatus or filtered uh, respirators, whatever the case is. Um, as well as if something horrible happens and the residue is spilled or or there's a lot of residue left over in the car and the employees are going to be exposed to it, how do they clean it? If it's involved in a fire, you know, something goes wrong, how do they how do they take care of that? So they need to have that so they know what they're dealing with. Um, you know, certain types of materials, you can't enter the car until certain things have been done to reduce the risk. The reason it can't come from a website, just any old website, is because just because the product is called the same thing doesn't mean it is the same thing. Just today, in fact, I was working on some epoxy resins for one of my clients. They have the same name. They just have a slightly different product number. It's a four-digit code, and one number is different. And the only thing different, they have the same four ingredients. The only thing different is the percentage of the main ingredient. And it's di it's different by 1%. So it's a range of this number to this number for the more dangerous one, and this number to that same number in the middle for the lower hazard one. So just that slight difference makes a big difference in the emergency response, in the exposure limitations, in the PPE that needs to be worn, because it, it in this case, in this particular case, it may, it's a, a, a hazard that would, would dictate certain things at the higher concentration. So just picking a random SDS off the site, I don't know if I'm getting the right concentration. I don't know if the stuff that you're making has trace elements in it that this one doesn't have. Um, you know, just because they look the same and smell the same doesn't mean they are the same. Everybody has proprietary things that they do that sets their product apart from somebody else's. Yeah, and something else people don't think about is specific gravity. So as a repair yeah. facility, if you're putting in a gauge rod, you know, a magnetic gauge rod, it could be like you said, the exact same name, same everything, but the specific gravity is different. So that matters to people that are shipping product because if it's off by a little bit, then you're losing money, right? It's well, or you can have worth the situation, which is an overloaded rail car. That's exactly right. Um, an overload of rail car because you've got the wrong gauging rod in there based on the wrong specific gravity could mean that you don't have enough outage for, room for expansion. So you get out into a hot summer day, for example, and all of a sudden you've got materials spewing out of your pressure relief device or your safety relief device. Um, so, yeah, that's a very good point. Absolutely. So shops, make sure you're getting current SDSs and they're coming from the car owner. Just saying. Oh, and you asked me a question about why they need to be within 12 months because things change, right? We may have a formulation change. We may have, or we can't get this product anymore. So we're going to switch to this one. So those sorts of changes, again, will affect what the car does on the other end. Yeah, for sure. And placards play an important role also in the transportation of hazardous materials by rail. So can you take a moment and explain to our audience the importance of proper placarding and the role they play if the placarding, God forbid, is incorrect. The first thing to know is what is the purpose of a placard? And a placard is meant to convey four pieces of information. So by the color, it conveys the, the hazard. In other words, if it's red, it's flammable. If it's yellow, it's an oxidizer. If it's green, it's compressed gas. You can tell right from the color at least the general category of things that it's in. The icon at the top gives you a further indication. If it's a flame icon, it's flammable. If it's a circle with a flame, it's an oxidizer. Skull and crossbones is poisonous. On the bottom corner of the placard tells you the hazard class number. Some of the hazard class placards look very similar. For example, flammable gas and flammable liquid. They're both red, they both have flames, they look very similar. The only difference is that number on the bottom, one's a two and one's a three. The last piece of information is either going to be words in the center of the placard or potentially a UN identification number. The UN identification number will tell you exactly what that material is anywhere around the world because it's the same number. There's a couple little minor exceptions for some domestic regulations we have here that no one else does, but by and large, most of them are global. So I can have, you know, UN 1050 here in the United States, and it's the same ammonia that's UN 1050 in China. The great thing about that is it takes out the language barrier, right? If someone's first language is not English, 
then they can still know what it is they're dealing with. As a former firefighter, I know we were taught over and over and over again, when you roll up onto a scene involving some sort of a freight vehicle, you don't just rush in because you don't know what you're going to run into. If you run up there and it's a poison gas, you're going to be another patient, another victim. So we were taught you when you roll up on scene, you stay far enough away that you could cover the entire scene with your thumb. We called it the rule of thumb. And if you could cover the entire scene with the, with your thumb, you're far enough away. We would use our binoculars to then look at the vehicle and try to determine what was in the material or what was in the what was in the vehicle. We could do that with if all we can see is the color, we at least have some information. If we can get as specific as the number, we have a lot of information. Um, if that number, that placard, that color is wrong, the response is going to be very different. I had a client one time who was shipping a poisonous material. It was actually uh, an oral poison, meaning if you ingest it, it's going to be uh, potentially fatal or at least damaging. Unfortunately, they use poison inhalation hazard placards. The only difference that you can tell is one has a black diamond at the top and one doesn't. Um, that is a huge difference in response. If something is an oral poison, I'm going to treat that very differently than I will if something is inhalation poison. Inhalation poison is about as dangerous as it gets. Um, so, th you know, they're going to go in there with full breathing apparatus and um, possibly full hazmat suits. And I mean, it's going to be a big deal. Whereas if it's an oral poison, it's a much less big deal. But that's why it's super important that they're correct. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine thinking it's one and end up being the other. But uh, but thank you for clarifying. That wasn't the other way around, though, that it was actually an right. inhalation poison and they thought it was oral poison, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, and during... Um, Episode two of season two, which you've probably heard with our good friend, John Schmitter of Rail State. Uh, we talked about uh, how improved network visibility across the entire U.S. network of railroads, uh, including the commodities inside the rail cars that they're carrying could potentially help first responders in the event of a derailment, God forbid. So what kind of help could network visibility provide for first responders? Well, there actually is a program that does that. Um, it's called Ask Rail. It's developed by the Association of American Railroads. Um, and as a result, Active East Palestine, they are doubling the amount of emergency responders that have access to that program. It's very, very tightly controlled. I had a chance to experience it myself. They uh, let me have an account and, and I got to actually test it out. It was pretty cool. Um, they actually told me that during the East Palestine derailment, someone was um, accessing the uh, Ask Rail program when they weren't actually at the scene. They could see where the person was, how many times they accessed it, how frequently they accessed it. And so they actually sent state police to go talk to that person and be like, why are you looking at this so often? What is your interest in this accident? Um, turns out they were just a, a railroad fan and were super interested in what was going on, but they had no need to know. They had no business being on there looking up that product. And the state police let him know in no uncertain terms that it was unacceptable. Um, so they, you know, they terminated his account. But the point is, is they because of East Palestine, they really have um, taken it under advisement that, that there needs to be more access to this for exactly the reasons you're talking about. So you know where stuff is, you know what's moving, you know what you know what to prepare your emergency responders for. If your emergency responders just have flammable liquids going through their area, okay, they can prepare one way for a fire response. But if they now have poisons and oxidizers and radioactives and and so forth, they're going to have a very different level of training. No, and that, thank you for sharing that with me because I was unaware of Ask Rail. So is that a system that anybody can have access to, do you think? Or is that something no. you specifically have to be a shipper or a first responder? Not even a shipper. You have to be an emergency responder, police, fire, um, and you have to have a need to know. So it's not just anybody in the fire department that can have it. Uh, it's not just any um, any person in emergency response that can have it. If you're If all you do is work on an ambulance, you don't have access to it. Um, so you have to uh, you have to request access. You have to be sponsored by someone. So if you're in a fire department, uh, you have to actually have a, a chief or an officer grant you access. Then the AAR has to approve it as well. So no, not just anyone can have access. And again, even if you do have access, legitimate access, you have to use it only legitimately for the things that you're involved in. So they can tell if you're at your home and you're just looking up an accident somewhere else. You have to be on the scene to be able to use that or else you're going to get notified. Exactly. And they are starting to put it also in the 911 facilities so that if you're on a place where there is no self-service, for example, um, or for whatever reason, the firefighters there don't have access on their phones. That's what it's made for. It's a phone app. Uh, then you can actually send, say, a police officer to the 911 facility, get the information from them and drive it to the scene if need be, or disclose it over the radio if need be. 
No, that's great. I love it. And according to the Association of American Railroads, or AAR, as you said earlier, there are about 1.6 or 1.7 billion tons of freight moved across railroads in the U.S. in a typical year. Uh, per the AAR, if railroads didn't operate in the U.S., it would take 99 million additional trucks on the roads. That's 99 million additional trucks uh, at four times the fuel versus rail to handle just the freight Americans rely on every day. With that said, while people tend to think of trucking and even pipeline as competitors of rail, they actually work together in the supply chain, including the transloading of products from one to another. So can you take a moment again to explain to our audience what transloading is and specifically to from rail to truck or truck to rail? So transloading is the transfer of product from one mode of transportation to another during the cycle of transportation. So it's left the origin, has not yet reached destination, and somewhere in the middle, they have to change services. A lot of times uh, this could happen because there's no railhead at the location where they need to drop it off or at the location where they need to pick it up. So they'll truck it to the railhead or from the railhead to where it needs to go. Um, so, uh, the reason that you would need so many more trucks is because a rail car can hold about three to four truck loads in one rail car. And then one train can have a hundred or 200 cars on that, on that one train pulled by, that, you know, one set of locomotives, depending on where it's going, maybe two, three, six. Um, but that one train can haul about 400 or more truck loads of material. So, um, so the process of transloading is usually done at a spot that's designated for it. You know, for example, CSX has some transflow facilities and a lot of the short line railroads are now setting up mobile where they just have uh, equipment that they drive up to it. It's not permanently, it's not a permanent structure. And they will either pull up a truck and offload the truck into the rail car. Then that truck pulls away. The next one pulls up, offloads into that rail car and so on and so forth. And you end up with three or four truckloads going into that same rail car where all that material will mix together. This was a really big thing during the crude oil boom where there was not access in the oil fields for the rail cars to get there. So the trucks would take it to uh, the terminal. The terminal would, would have uh, about 100 rail cars lined up ready to take all this oil and truck after truck after truck after truck would bring this oil in and dump it directly into the rail car. One really cool problem that they had, and I say cool because it was unique and they hadn't experienced this before, is because of the natural properties of the crude oil, one of the problems that it caused was the, the younger rigs, the oil rigs, would have a much higher amount of the light ends of the oil than the older ones. So you would get a much more volatile oil from the younger, newer uh, oil rigs. And so when it got to the, the rail car and, you know, you mixed all these different trucks together, the properties of one rail car to the next rail car could be kind of different, sometimes very different, uh, different packing groups, different volatility, different flash points. So it, it can cause some issues, but a lot of times these are going to be manufactured products, which are built and made to a specification. So you're not going to run into that as much typically. Yeah. And the different types of crude, as you said, I was up there at the time, we were running mobile rail car repair uh, up in the Bakken. And uh, we didn't realize, or the car owners didn't realize uh, what the, the it had 10% water, I believe it was. 10% water in the oil a lot of times. And they weren't expecting that with the high H2S content. When you combine the two, you get hydrochloric acid, right? In the vapor space between the, the liquid and the top of the car, as you mentioned earlier. So uh, that led to having line all the cars, which was not something that anyone had intended on doing. So you're right. It's interesting how something that simple can make such a difference. And also, I remember seeing how massive these facilities were, like up in Williston, North Dakota, and in Dickinson, North Dakota. Uh, I mean, huge uh, loop tracks and everything, and it was really something to see. Uh, and then the other byproduct was uh, LPG, right? Or nat yes. they were flaring everywhere. So you'd drive through there at night, and you'd see them in the distance. And it was it was really something. Of course, they changed the the laws on some of that now, uh, but. Yeah, that was always really interesting. And of course, safety is paramount in uh, transloading hazardous materials. So what are some of the most common risks that you see when transloading hazardous materials from rail to truck or truck to rail? One of the things that I've noticed, because there's a there's a huge increase in transloading recently by companies who've either never done it before or have done transloading, but not with hazardous materials. And one of the real problems that I've seen is either A, they're not well trained and they don't understand the hazards of the material they're working with, or B, they've only ever worked on trucks and they don't understand that rail cars don't operate the same way or vice versa. You know, everyone thinks, oh, they're, they're all road vehicles. They are so different in how they function, how they operate, the way that you 
work with them, the way that you secure them for closure. So it's really important that you are properly trained before you start an operation like this so you can mitigate those hazards and so that you can make sure that the rail car and the truck are both properly secured for transportation, that the uh, connections are all tight before you do the transfer so fumes aren't escaping and liquids not escaping or, or whatever the case is. So a lack of training is a really big problem right now with all this new increase in transloading activity. Well, and you may have already answered a part of this, and if so, I apologize, but what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people make when transloading hazardous materials? Uh, I would say the biggest one is is not properly closing one or the other vehicles. And part of that is because uh, they weren't trained how to do a proper inspection. So things like gaskets don't get replaced like they should. Um, they also uh, sometimes don't ground things the way they should. You know, rail cars, for example, have lugs on them, grounding lugs that are specifically designed for that purpose. And some trucks do, but some don't. And I've seen more than one uh, transloading operation where they tried to ground to a part of either the truck or the rail car that was painted. And as you probably know, that's not going to reduce a good ground, you know, and sometimes they'll scratch it down to where they try to get down to the metal, but it's just very unreliable. So if you're going to have a grounding system, which you should, especially for flammables, but you should anyway, make sure that you have a positive ground system where there will be a light or some sort of an indication as to whether or not you have a ground and whether it's a good ground. So that way, if you lose ground for any reason during the process, you know that too, because one little spark could really ruin your day. Oh, and everybody's day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what are some unique challenges transloaders may face with rail versus truck? A rail car is actually quite a bit more complicated in certain ways than a truck is. And if you don't understand the different functions of it and what, you, what each part does, you could end up doing things incorrectly in a way that might hurt you. People don't understand, for example, um, which one here basic thing that I see all the time is they don't understand certain connections are only hand tight connections. And if you put a tool on them, you're going to break the valve and cause a leak. So for example, the a thermal well or a gauging device, you know, you, those are supposed to be hand tight connections. And if you, if you over tighten those and you break them, uh, now you have an opening into the rail car because that's not designed for that. In the case of the gauging device, you know, there's, there's, uh, material inside of that. And that if that breaks, now that, that contamination is in, uh, is in the car. And in case of a thermal well, it's got ethylene glycol in there. So if you if you over tighten that and the ethylene glycol gets into the product, you've now ruined the product potentially. And you've also uh, provided an opening for whatever the material is to leave the car in transportation. So not understanding that not everything is cranked down the way, you know, the liquid or the airline is uh, could really cause you a problem. Yeah. And it's important uh, to note that ethylene glycol, I, I've forgotten about that, to be honest with you, but you're absolutely right that that cracks, it goes right into the commodity and that's a problem. Yeah. So, I had one, com one client, um, they, they broke that and the product was hexamethylene diamine. And they, uh, I, I happened to be there to do an audit and I opened up the rail car and there's all this white crystal powder all over the place. And what a mess because somebody had cranked it down, broken it. And now all this HMD was all over the inside of this car. It was, it was horrible. So and then I've seen another one where they broke the gauging device right off in there because they cranked it down and, and uh, broke the top of it. And now pieces of the gauging device are down inside the car. Um, that was also a pretty big mess. So for our listeners and viewers that don't know, um, ethylene glycol is essentially antifreeze. And so can you explain why there's antifreeze in there for folks to, that are listening? Well, yeah, because in cold environments, for example, or if you have a product that's loaded uh, in, in cold temperatures, you will potentially have the, the, the material freeze. And so you have to have something for that for that device to be protected. So the ethylene glycol is in there so that, uh, you know, even if it goes to North Dakota on a, on a winter day, it's still going to function as intended. Yeah. And, and not freeze, <laughs> which would, exactly, which it would freeze. do otherwise. So what advice would you give to those involved in transloading of hazardous materials, whether it's rail or truck or both? If you don't have somebody on your staff who is well versed in rail car operations and in truck operations, then hire an outside third party. You know, get the training that you need. Make sure that you're doing it safely. If you don't know the hazards of the material that you're going to be transloading, all you've ever done is non-hazardous, for example, or you're going to be starting a product that you've never done before, it's really important that you understand what those hazards are. Looking up on Google what PPE you should be wearing to to transload this product or to load or unload, that's, that's not really going to get it done, right? You've got to have somebody who knows the material, and it could be contacting the manufacturer, it could be getting the SDS and and talking to the experts at the manufacturer and saying, 
okay, what do we need to know about this product to do it safely? And I'm sure they will share that with you. I, I've never had any experience in this industry where I've had questions about something and the knowledgeable person wasn't willing to share that with me. So ask the questions. I agree. And it's funny you say that. I was thinking just the other day how when I was creating a quality assurance manual for a company that I was helping start up, I went to the FRA and said, hey, would you mind taking a look at this quality assurance manual for me before we went live? You know, they said, are you kidding? I said, no, no, I, I would love for you to look at it. And they said that uh, they really enjoyed that because they want to be considered a resource. And I don't think people think of the AAR and FRA and other organizations, uh, DOT, as resources, but they really are. I mean, that's and we could, I think, all use with uh, looking at them that way. And it would help us a lot avoiding problems on the front end rather than the back end. Well, you know, when I was a DOT inspector, I started my career there as a 20 uh, something female. So, um, you know, at the, in the beginning of my career, it was difficult for people to get to take me seriously. I'm, you know, five feet tall and um, I always looked very young for my age. So I looked like I was about 12 at that time. <laughs> and so I walk into their facility with a badge and they're looking at me like, are you kidding me? Um, so it took a while. And I'll tell you the day that I realized that I had finally started to earn the respect of my colleagues and my peers was when my clients, my constituents, when I was an inspector, actually started calling me, say, hey, we've got this situation. We want to ask you about this beforehand. And then I was like, you know what? They finally trust me. Um, I was honored. I would always take the time to answer their questions, whatever it was. I, no matter what I was doing, as long as I was in a safe place, I would always take the time. And so I am certain that most of your uh, FRA inspectors would feel the same way. Yeah. And now look, people are calling you all the time. <laughs> yes, thank God. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. So despite the good safety record of the railroad industry as a whole, some only want to report the bad news. And typically that's all we hear is the bad news, not the good news. Well, I do have some good news to share. Uh, according to a report from the Association of American Railroads, or AAR, on AAR.org, from an article called Rails Safety Record, the derailment rate of all railroads is down 31% since 2000. The pre-carload hazmat accident rate is down 78% since 2000 and is the lowest ever based on preliminary Bureau of Explosives data. Surface Transportation Board Chairman, who is now not seeking reappointment, I'm very sad to hear that, Marty Oberman, was quoted as making several statements in a press conference on March 15th, 2023, regarding the STB's approval of the merger at that time that was being considered, which has now been completed, of the KCS and CP Class 1 railroads, which is now CPKC, and how the merger would have no negative impact on safety due to the potential of increased train volumes. Mr. Oberman said in part, and I'm quoting, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics documented last year, which would have been 2022, that 94% of all hazardous material spills occur occurred on truck and only 1% occurred on rail, he said. Continue on. So if you were to, tr to try to make uh, some communities safer all over the country, you would want to move more of this material by train rather than by truck. And we have to be realistic when we talk about what these hazardous materials are. Many of them are the foundation of our economy, which is what you talked about earlier, which is hazardous materials are literally in everything. And believe it or not, we're getting close to the end of our episode already, Wendy. Our one year anniversary episode is drawing to a close. <laughs> it's so, <kind> of bittersweet. <laughs> well, absolutely. But you, you know, I, I'll never forget. So, on our first time together, you said, I'm going to come back for your one year anniversary. And, and I have to laugh because I did not know this, but apparently most podcasts only last for one episode. If you get to six, you're a rock star. Well, this is episode 13. So, so thank you again for helping us get things kicked off a year ago. Couldn't have done it without you. And, I, I, I'm curious. So last year I asked you uh, what were some of your pet peeves in hazmat. So this time I want to ask you, what do you enjoy most about your career in hazmat? Oh, gosh, there's so many things. I absolutely love what I do. The fact that I get to do things every single day that help protect people, that help save lives, and even that help keep companies operating so, you know, it's, it's, uh, we kind of say that we protect people, property, and profits. And profits doesn't seem all that important, but the reason it is, is because the more money that a company can make, the more that we have jobs, the more that we have a livelihood that can support our families. So if your company is going out of business because they had so many safety violations that the legal ramifications are staggering, all those people are going to lose a job. So if we can keep them profitable, keep them growing, then our job security is that much better. 
Um, and of course, you know, I spent my career as a firefighter and, a, and an FRA inspector, and I saw all the things that go wrong and all the things that people make mistakes doing. And now I have the opportunity to prevent those things from happening, to prevent the next person from losing a limb or losing their life. And that to me is so much more rewarding than anything else I could be doing. I love my job and I get to do different things every single day. Every day I get up with the plan, the phone rings and the whole plan changes. And I just find that so exciting. I don't have to do the same thing day in and day out. And I get to see so many different facilities, so many different operations, and I learn something every day. I just love it. Yeah, we love having you on the show. So we're hoping to have you on again, maybe next year. Absolutely. I'll definitely <laughs> be your, uh, your anniversary year. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we go? Thank you so much for having me. I love doing this. I love being a part of it. Um, I enjoy this this uh, interacting with you. And I'm, I really hope your audience enjoys this podcast as well. If anybody has any questions, they are more than welcome to reach out to me. I am available on LinkedIn. Um, and, and my website has my phone number and email. So by all means, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. We will have all your contact information as well on the uh, the episode. They can click on all the different links. But do you want to go ahead and give them your, your contact information while we have you? Sure. The web address is starshazmat.com, stars with an S. It's an acronym, actually. Uh, and uh, LinkedIn, you can find me under Wendy Buckley, or you can find our company under Stars Hazmat Consulting. Um, our, our email is info at starshazmat.com. And uh, my cell phone is 267-324-4002. Please call anytime. So thank you again, Wendy. It's truly been a pleasure. And uh, we will think of you as we eat the celebratory uh, cake, um, <laughs> which, which is going to completely destroy my uh, <clears throat> my health. But <laughs> that's all right. I don't, I don't do it very often, so it's worth it to do once a year. Where are you going to be? Where can people find you? Is there any upcoming uh, seminars or c conferences you'll be at? Oh, yes, absolutely. So this weekend, actually, I'm leaving to go to TCA, which is truckload carriers, which not necessarily for your audience. Um, I'll be at TIA, which is the Intermediate uh, Transportation Intermediaries Association. I'll be at CASPA, which is a dangerous goods organization. Um, I will also be at the Southwest Fertilizer Conference. I am at Mars every year. That's where yep. you and I met. Yep. Uh, that's in January. And oh, and the Dangerous Goods Symposium. I'll be there as well. Other than that, you're not doing anything. No, I, I sit at home with nothing to do, absolutely. Four kids, a business, and lots of travel. Yeah, I'm, I'm bored. <laughs> well, well, God bless you. you got a busy schedule, that's for sure. Wendy, always a pleasure. Thank you again for joining us on our anniversary of the one year of the American Railroading Podcast. Thank you, Don. I can't wait to be back for a year, too. Sounds good to me. Bye-bye. And, and with that, we're going to close with, again, my two cents, which is something new that we're doing this season uh, for what it's worth. So my two cents is that railroading has been around in the U.S. for over 230 years. And the data shows that the rails is the safest way to move freight by ground in the U.S. Is it perfect? No. And when incidents do happen, they need to be investigated with the root cause identified and corrective action implemented to prevent them from happening again in the future. But I do applaud the rail industry for always being proactive, even when they're not required to, and spending millions of dollars every single year striving to make our industry safer. So again, that's my two cents. So again, I want to thank our new platinum sponsor, the Alden Company. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Founded in 1904, Alden has been an industry leader, charting a steady course in the manufacturing and distribution of a wide variety of railroad safety and track repair tools and more. The Alden website boasts over 800 catalog items to choose from, with categories including track maintenance and repair, derailers and railers, signs and lights, wheel chocks and stops, rail cars and locomotives, and even truck docks. Alden provides outstanding customer service with a wide variety of solutions, and when you call them, you will always get a real person to talk to, not an automated service. While based in the Chicagoland area, the Alden name is known internationally, and with over 120 years in the rail industry, they're a company you can count on. Please reach out to our friends at Alden today at 847-623-8800 or e-rail at aldenco.com. You can also review all of their products and resources on their website at www.aldenco.com. Alden, keeping things on track since 1904. And I also want to recognize our anchor sponsor, the Revolution Rail Group. Again, we are a consulting and brokering firm in the rail car industry, providing consulting for merger and acquisition, process flow analysis, market analysis, even short-time management solutions. 
And we can also help you with buying, selling, leasing, or subleasing rail cars. So reach out to us today at 844-455-3434. You can email us at info at therevolutionrailgroup.com. And you can also check out our full suite of services at therevolutionrailgroup.com. Again, our on st- on- online store is live, so please check it out at AmericanRailroading.net and click on the store tab and buy to your heart's desire, especially our challenge coins, because again, a portion of that goes to Boots for Troops in 2024. And our next episode is coming soon, and we're going to have more about Tech Talk. I know you really like Tech Talk in our previous episode, so we're going to continue to focus on technology this year. We find it as exciting as you do, and we're looking forward to more of it. With that, I say God bless, make it a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on the American Railroading Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover on a future episode or want to support or sponsor the show, please visit our website at AmericanRailroading.net.